This conference is now being recorded. Good afternoon. Welcome to the New York ASPO webinar, Data-Driven Decision-Making. My name is Matthew Darius. I'm the Senior Staff Associate for Professional Development, and I will be moderating today's call. Um, if you have questions at any time, please feel free to use the chat window on your screen or press 7 pound on your phone. If you hit 7 pound, I'll put you right through to our presenter, and then you two can uh, talk right over the phone to answer your question. Today's presenter is uh, Stephen Ayers, Ed D, CPA, and he will be um, taking you through data-driven decision-making. Steve? Thanks, Matt. I think the first thing I have to ask for is I need the um, controller uh, screen so I can start. There you go. Thank you. Already got you. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining me. I appreciate it. It's, um, we're going to take about an hour, I think, up to uh, run through some of the aspects of data-driven decision-making, kind of by way of background. For reasons I was never able to adequately explain to my wife, I decided to enroll in a uh, doctoral program a couple of years back. The course of it developed a particular interest in program evaluation, and I ultimately did a dissertation uh, evaluating a particular program here in the Hilton School District. Uh, in particular, it was the um, class size reduction model, where we reduced our first grade class sizes down to 15 for a period of time. Uh, after completing the dissertation, I was uh, bullied into by my, one of my professors of submitting an article to School Business Affairs uh, regarding it, and it seemed to have caught the attention of Matt and others at, the, um, at ASBO, and so here I am presenting today. So just very quickly, what I will try to run through over a period of time is a little bit about the, the challenge that we face of looking at data in school districts and then running through some of what I, my views on how we make meaning of data uh, and then what I believe to be an important element of pre preparing an evaluation or of uh, a program evaluation, and then some of the available data resources, and, and I'll certainly try to leave time for questions and answers. One other important caveat, although I'll be talking about a number of elements of st statistics and statistical analysis, uh, it's going to require significant investment of time on, you know, on others' parts to really get into and start to make effective use of it. If it could all be accomplished in the course of a one-hour webinar, I think it's safe to say I wasted an awful lot of uh, time and money going through another program. But just to kind of jump in, my view of the challenge, and I don't think anyone would probably argue with me to any large degree, is we're all faced with situations where we're seeing declines in our state um, funding in terms of the amount of uh, state aid that's being provided to us. And, of course, now our lo local resources have been uh, capped in the form of the property tax cap. So we've been making difficult decisions in our budgets for the last couple of years, and it's pretty clear they're going to be even come even more difficult uh, as we roll into this next phase of the of New York State's difficulty. At the same time, we've all worked hard in our districts to put together programs uh, that are making a difference in, in children's learning and their achievement, and we need to be careful that we're not uh, you know, impairing or losing highly effective programs, that we make a legitimate evaluation and try to identify those which are making significant contributions towards results uh, and those which are, are, are not making a difference. Many of these principles, however, can equally be applied to any other aspect of dist district operations, although I chose to focus uh, my study on, on um, uh, academic performance and, and an academic initiative. It could certainly be applied to almost any another, other initiative in the business office, in operations and maintenance, et cetera. But with respect to the students, again, thanks to no, no Child Left Behind, we find ourselves having more student performance data available than we've ever had before. But yet our districts, I think, to a large degree, are ill-equipped to really do any kind of meaningful analysis of the data. We often uh, find ourselves relying on anecdotal qualitative information in the absence of any real confidence on the part of some, particularly some of our uh, instructional leaders on how to look at and, and analyze the data that's in front of them. The way I've tried to describe that uh, in the past is I, I've used this uh, kind of a coin toss metaphor. And, uh, you know, what I'm kind of describing here is picture, if you will, instead of, say, you know, the, the grade four ELA exam, the exam is coin tossing. And so, therefore, the exercise is every student in a grade has to flip a coin. And the, to meet the state standards, you have, have to get heads. So we run this uh, exercise, and at the end of the day, the students in school one, as you can see on my slide here, got heads 52% of the time, and the students in our other school only got heads 48% of the time. Well, in education, we would then conclude, well, the teachers in school one are doing a better job teaching coin tossing, and we need to build on that strength that they clearly have and get them over to school number two and display their 
teaching techniques to the school to fa school to faculty. Excuse me. We can probably build an entire uh, conference day around this. So we go through and do this, and the following uh, year we take the same exam, and we find that um, school number one, the um, actually I believe I said this backwards, in school number two the uh, the students improved from 48 percent up to 50 percent, but in school number one the rate declined from 52 to 51 percent. So in that scenario, what we would tend to expect at the next time we talked about instructional results, we'd say, well, the in-service worked. We should continue funding it. But we're concerned about the decline in, in the other schools' uh, results, and we're going to continue to monitor it. Obviously, this is a you know, pretty farcical example, but the intent is to kind of illustrate a couple of key elements of what we're doing in data uh, in schools. When we analyze data, we typically are seem to limit it to just simple comparisons of means without any real consideration of the statistical significance of the differences. Clearly, when I talk about coin tossing, we know that the outcome of coin tossing is purely random. But yet, when we talk about student results, we often ignore the fact of how random from one day to the next the results may be. A student may perform well on a test one day, take the very same test a couple of days later, and whatever environmental factors cause the change, their, their results may vary by a couple of points. So some of the differences that we looked at aren't real differences, they're, they're nothing more than random variation. And in turn, we try to establish cause and effect between these initiatives, and if we see improvement in results, it must have worked, and if we don't see improvement in results, well, it didn't work, and we never really dig deep into the supporting evidence, was the change truly meaningful, was anything more than normal random variability. That's a lot of what drew me into my interest in looking at program evaluation because of the lack of really intense um, examination of the data and did the data really truly make sense. So when I look at a program evaluation, the, the elements that I you know, typically would expect to see in there, something about a logic model, something that describes from the outset what was the program we sought to set up and what was the outcomes that we thought it would produce as a result. From there, we then begin to identify and develop a plan for collecting the data. How are we going to evaluate the data? How are we going to establish a baseline or a pre-initiative uh, calculation? And how are we going to then um, measure the data after we've in implemented the initiative to see if we found a change? And then finding an appropriate statistical analysis model to be used and test the data, and then finally reviewing the results and form a conclusion. Let me start with the notion of a logic model. A logic model, as I would define it, is basically a detailed analysis of the program or the initiative or whatever uh, you know, th um, thing that we have implemented that we want to test, looking at everything from the inputs it's going to take to get that initiative up off the ground to what are the outcomes that were expected. The purpose in looking at this, and I will say that in my doctoral work at, at the U of R, this, the logic model was probably one of the big aha moments for me. It gives you that ability to really identify what are the variables, what do we need to do, how can we test this, where can we find where, if it didn't work, where did it break down. The key elements of a logic model, uh, we're looking at the inputs, what are the resources to be provided uh, externally from the district, what are the activities, what are some of the things that need to occur along the way to make this, uh, uh, this initiative take place, what are some of the outputs, what are the uh, short-term things that we're going to produce and then finally, immediate, intermediate, long-term outcomes. How will we see changes as a result of that? On this next slide, um, don't be overly intimidated by it. This is um, uh, actually taken from my dissertation where I analyzed um, the, the impact of uh, class size reduction. And this is the level of detail often required of uh, a dissertation committee as to what is ne say necessary to uh, complete a, a survey in-house. So this is a little on the uh, detail side, but we, what you do is you get a kind of an illustration of what I mean by inputs, activities, outputs, and then the various levels of, of outcomes. In my case here in this example, you notice that in, in black font, uh, under intermediate and long-term outcomes, were the particular elements that I wanted to try to construct a plan to analyze and, uh, and assess uh, in, in doing my workup. Moving on then. Talking about the process of looking at data, um, in my view, there's a few sets of data that you really need to come to understand. Really, the most key one is the dependent variable. You're looking for a way in which you're going to measure what happened because you introduced this particular initiative. In my case, because I was looking at uh, whether or not class size made a reduction, 
I said, let's look at grade four ELA scores as an example. So three years after students had a reduced class size first grade, could I see some impact that it had long term on how they were performing by the time they reached fourth grade? Uh, we could be looking at initiatives in the business office of things like uh, you know, error rates on payroll or turnaround time on making accounts payable. We could be looking at um, some, you know, some changes in how we do operations and maintenance types things, uh, cleaning cycles and things like that, but something that measures what changed as a result of what we did. Then we look at the independent variable side. The independent variable are kind of those fixed elements that we believe give rise to a particular outcome. So in one case, it can be the, uh, the main one I view is the focus variable, and this is something that shows, did we do the initiative? So it can just simply be in the case of class size reduction. Was there class size reduction in my base year? Obviously no. Was there class size reduction in the, you know, the, the subsequent years that I measured? Obviously yes, so that becomes a variable of, of kind of an off, on, or a yes, no type of a variable. It can also be something that's more of a scale type basis, how much of the initiative was applied. So how much, uh, you know, how much additional staffing was provided, how much additional time was provided, how much additional money was provided, things of that nature. But it's specifically the action that you believe will cause some change if, 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 it's, if it truly is being effective. Then the other sort of independent variables that we'll tend to look at, I'd call them demographic variables. And as you can see in the description here, it's other elements of the population tested which might have an effect on the outcome. So for example, um, gender may make a difference. We may find that a particular instructional program has a different effect on boys as it does to girls on their test scores. FARPL is a little acronym for free and reduced price lunch. Again, does poverty make a difference uh, so that something is having more or less of an impact? Student with disability status, attendance rate, other things that may affect the results so that if I look at the entire population, I may see one outcome, but if I look at subsets of the population, things may look a little bit different to us. Again, giving you a little bit of an idea of what that could look like, this again is information that's drawn from the analysis, the, the program evaluation that I did, and I identified six different measurements that I wanted to use as my de dependent variables in my own workup, uh, and you can see very quickly they involved scores of how students were doing on reading at the end of first and second grade, and then how they did on state assessments in both English language arts and math in subsequent grades. Then when I took a look at the independent variables, obviously a, uh, a much more, a more significant list, but you start with the very first one was my focus variable, reduced size in first grade classroom. I was either yes, it was traditionally size, or no, it was reduced size, meaning there were less 15 students in the class. But then I just tried to identify a whole number of other areas that might be a factor in whether students did uh, perform better or not. Things such as what types of other programming we were giving them. Things about uh, their teachers to whom they were assigned and their level of preparation. And then things about just the student's own demographics, things that I already mentioned, stuff like gender, uh, free and reduced lunch, uh, race, ethnicity, etc. But it was just taking a very comprehensive look. And again, for a first time trying to do an evaluation, I wouldn't recommend pulling in all these variables. Uh, but it was, you know, in the case of what I was attempting to do, this was a year-long effort and, uh, and required this level of, uh, of scrutiny. So once we've pulled the data together, we then need to figure out, so what does it tell us? What is different? Did we, did we have an impact in any way, shape, or form? So what we we're trying to do is see, was there a difference before we started the, uh, the particular initiative we want to test and afterwards? But the key element in this is talking about was it significant, okay? Uh, the general definition of significance is a measurement of the probability that the results observed were due to random variability in the population versus the effect of the, of the independent variable that we tested. So put another way, if I look at, uh, at a mean score on, on something and then I, uh, before I implemented it and a mean score after, go back to my um, coin tossing example, is the difference that occurred between the two significant enough, large enough, that it is just highly unlikely that it's just some random chance that happened to be the numbers that occurred that day, and that it's more likely it's attributable to something that's new or different in the population. Generally, when doing statistical work, you're looking for a significance, and we usually uh, describe that significance by this lowercase p of equal to or, or less than 0.05, which is simply saying that there's less than a 5% chance that the differences observed could have occurred randomly. 
you're really into statistics, you're saying you're more than two standard deviations away from the mean, but the, again, the whole idea is limiting the risk that we're forming the wrong conclusion by looking at the data. So there's a variety of tests that may apply. I'm going to just take a few minutes, run through some of the, the tests. Um, this is just kind of telling you that they're out there and what they are. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I do have some suggestions on places that you may want to go for additional resources to gain some comfort level in what these tests are and, and when they make sense to apply them. Uh, the typical test, uh, the, you know, the most basic test that you tend to use comparing two sets of means is called the t-test or sometimes also called the student t-test. And it literally is just looking at two different populations and the resulting means and saying, are the differences between these two populations uh, significant? So in the case of our coin tossing example, if we were to run that test on those two patterns, we would most likely find that we would not see significance, or put another way, that p-value would be something much, much larger than 0.05, meaning it is more likely than not that the difference was just because of the randomness of the fact that we were flipping coins as opposed to somebody actually figured out a way to uh, influence whether a co uh, coin came up uh, heads or tails through, you know, through technique, et cetera. Another test that is often used um, is called the ANOVA, or analysis of variance. It's very, very similar to the t-test, but it can be used to try to compare two or more populations. So for example, you may be trying to compare three or four different work sites or schools or things of that nature, and you're trying to look at the results within each of them and looking to uh, therefore determine was there a difference comparing school one to two, school one to three, uh, school uh, two to three, et cetera. It is also something that's very useful to do in kind of comparing your independent variables of your pre and post population, making sure that they really are substantially equivalent. If you think about uh, you know, the typical um, drug company response, uh, you know, uh, breakthroughs, and they talk about independent testing, you'll typically see uh, people talking about the testing involving double blind and control groups and things of that nature. Well, control groups is something that is just not available to us here in education. We don't take one group of students and say, we're going to deprive you of a good initiative, and another group of students and say, we're going to give you the initiative, and then see how they end up. That's the sort of thing you do on, on um, uh, you know, voluntary populations or, or laboratory animals or that sort of thing. It doesn't, and there's obviously has no place in uh, an education where we have to try, you know, give our best effort to do all. So in 10, what we typically, excuse me, in, instead what we typically tend to do is use what we call comparison groups. We use comparison groups to be something that will be very comparable to a control group, but there is still, um, you know, um, there, there is no level of um, depriving of anybody of one initiative or another. So as an example, again, I go back to the, uh, to the test that I used. Uh, I took a look at and trying to analyze uh, the impacts on class size reduction pulled together the first grade classes for the two years before we reduced uh, the number of students in a classroom and tried to take a look at, uh, at how they, they compared. Now, obviously, there could be differences in it. I could have had a change in a number of demographics. I could have had a much more experienced teaching staff two years later. I could have had uh, you know, a change in our free and reduced lunch percentage. I could have had a change in the number of students with disabilities. There could be things that would cause the populations to no longer be comparable and then it therefore would tend to lose the, the value of my results in, in those things. So things like the ANOVA help you to make sure that uh, the populations that you're comparing are comparable by really kind of putting the independent variables side by side and saying there's really no difference between the two populations. Another one that we will tend to use actually fairly frequently in schools are, we are referred to as chi-square tests. And where they tend to be used is if you're trying to compare data that's not a measurable number, I refer to here as nominal or categorical, uh, or when the distribution between the outcomes is unknown. So examples, we do a survey and we have answers like yes, no, or we have a gender, you know, where, you know, is it someone male or female, or Likert scale type responses where I ask someone to rate something on a scale of one to five or, you know, one to three or whatever. There is no real mathematical difference between a value of one and a value of two and a value of three so that you can do mathematical type analysis that's, that's, that's really all that meaningful. A two isn't twice as valuable as a one like it would be if you're measuring the amount of something that was being provided. So when we look at a Likert scale or, or things of that nature, 
this is where the chi-square comes in kind of because it kind of gets us past that problem. What it now tries to do is take a look at where do the results distribute between the various outcomes. So, for example, if I were looking at a population and one of my variables was gender, I would certainly expect 50% male, 50% female. And if I pull out my population and find that I have something that is 30% male and 70% female, I'm clearly significantly out from what I would expect uh, to be the distribution of those responses. A chi-square test helps me find out does that degree of variation from what I'm expecting, makes, is it significant and makes sense. An example I gave here on the screen, I talk about a Likert scale of one to four. All things being equal, I should have 25% of my responses in each category, and when I have greater or less than that, it's potentially telling me something, and the measurements of the chi-square kind of tell us is, is it enough of a difference that I can conclude that there's something going on here, again, besides just different responses on different days type variability. What is my favorite in the areas of looking at um, uh, trying to make meaning out of the data is in the area of correlation and regression. Correlation, uh, very simply, I think is probably one of the more intuitive statistical concepts, is just measuring the extent to which if I change one item, an independent variable, how much corresponding change would I expect in dependent variables. If I raise prices by 25 cents in my school lunch program, how much effect will I see on the corresponding demand? Will I see uh, demand drop by, you know, by the equivalent, you know, by that same percentage increase, or will I see it stay flat? That tells me the degree to which uh, one action, the, ch the setting of the price, is correlated to the other action, the decision to purchase the product which I'm selling. Um, related to correlation is the notion of regression. And what regression then attempts, attempts to do is to take that correlation that we've calculated and determine if I can then predict what an outcome will be. So I may, for example, be looking at our academic intervention program. And if I take um, you know, a student that has had a particular result and I say, well, if I gave them AIS services, can I predict based on the fact that they scored a certain value on the last assessment and then I gave them AIS services, can I predict how many points their score may be expected to increase on the next assessment. It's an example of how you might apply regression. Uh, for those of you who remember finally back to the days of um, taking geometry in high school, it's really dealing with just the notions of slope and intercept, um, uh, you know, when you were, when you were dealing with uh, plain, ge uh, excuse me, plain geometry. And then where you, it really begins to become powerful is when you start talking about multiple linear regression. With multiple regression, what you're doing is taking a whole bunch of these different independent variables. Think of the long list of independent variables that I used in my uh, dissertation that I shared a few slides back and try to say, okay, uh, the ultimate score that someone is going to get on the ELA-4 exam, what would I expect them to get with none of these various factors being involved and then how much will my predicted score change as a result of everything from things like gender or free and reduced lunch participation levels to whether or not they had uh, class size reduction as a factor. And um, you can do some amazingly powerful things. I led a summer workshop for our administrative um, cabinet a couple of years back in which we took the sixth grade ELA, ELA, excuse me, math results and used it going forward in time to look at the most recent ninth grade results and said to what extent did I know in grade six, how my students were going to do on grade nine, and we found we could predict uh, fairly accurately from sixth grade where it would take those ninth grade results. Click on the wrong spot. Okay. okay. So once we run the test, and as I'm going to kind of close in a couple of moments uh, with uh, sharing with you some of the ways in which you're able to get uh, get at and, and use these formulas, we need them kind of form a conclusion. Typically, what we're looking for is did the testing results, were they significant at an acceptable p-value? Remember, p is that measure of significance. I'm looking for a p-value typically of less than 0.05. And if the, if the answer to that is yes, then we conclude, okay, there is a, an effect that we have identified. It has significance, and therefore we're prepared to conclude that, um, you know, that this particular initiative made the change that we were seeking or did not make the change that we were seeking. One element that is very important in looking at this stuff is understanding the difference between correlation and causation. And simply put, the fact that two things are correlated doesn't necessarily mean 
that one, in fact, causes the other. And the next slide is actually going to explore that concept a little bit, little bit. But before going on, at the point in which you're forming a conclusion, one of the other things you really need to take a hard look at is, are there other limitations or biases in your analysis that affect its relation, reliability? Was, um, was I not able to measure every aspect of the population that I would like to have been able to measure? Did I find that the way in which um, some of the questions were asked, the way in which some of the items were, uh, were measured, did that have some built-in bias such that if I had designed it differently, I'd have had a different chance? It's kind of that inward look at uh, to what extent did my work as a researcher influence the outcome versus to what extent is the data speaking for itself. Let me jump ahead and go back to this, um, this notion of correlation and causation. Um, and I, kind of, I love this example because I think this really demonstrates it. Let's assume for argument's sake that someone conducted a study that found that uh, rise, you know, whether the crime rate went up or down was actually positively correlated to the sales of ice cream. So at the time in which you know, sales of ice cream were low, so was the crime rate. When ice cream was at its peak levels of, um, of sales, you know, the local ice cream shops, suddenly the crime rate was equally high. So we've, got a, we've done our, all of our work. The statistics tell us very clearly it's a strong correlation. So then the question means, then, you know, is posed, so should we think about banning sales of ice cream? And if we did, would crime decline? And obviously, it's a pretty preposterous answer. Uh, ice cream is probably never a factor in whether or not someone decides to commit a crime, unless perhaps they want to rob the ice cream shop. So a more reasonable explanation would be that both crimes and ice cream sales occur more in the summer months, when the weather is warm and people are outside more often. Simply put, when people are inside, there's not as much crime as when people are outside. And uh, so the causation in all of this is maybe somewhat more weather-related, and both of them are... Uh, correlated, in fact, to the temperature, and they're not necessarily, um, caught, one is not causing the other between the ice cream and the crime. So it's just an important caution when you're looking at your results to make sure that you recognize the difference between can I say one caused the other versus can I just simply say that there is a relationship between the two that one, the two are, uh, that one is associated with the other. I mentioned some resources for doing these sorts of calculation. Uh, <coughs> When I did my um, dissertation work, I used a statistical package called SPSS, which I think is Statistical Package for the Social Sciences. Uh, it's a very powerful package. It's a very expensive package, unless you can get a student uh, copy of it. Uh, as it turns out, though, most of the things that I described today are available right now on Excel and can easily be run. And what I've done on this table here is listed how you're able to run a number of these. So for example, the, the standard deviation uh, has its own uh, function, STDEV. So you can literally look at a population in which you might calculate an average, and you can run the same formula for standard deviation and get a sense of not only what is the average, but how much um, dispersion around that mean or around that average are, are the rest of the results. Is everything tightly clustered, meaning that there's quite a bit of reliability in the numbers, or are they all over the map and the average is just you know, the, the, the middle of a, of a very wide range of results? Uh, the t-test also exists as a as a fun function, as does both then the chi test and calculation as the correlation. The other two that I listed on here, the ANOVA and the regression, they don't have their own functions per se. However, included with the Microsoft Office package, there's no extra charge for this. There is an option called the Excel Analysis Tool Pack, and if you go in, clicking on the menu bar and going under Excel Options and selecting manage add-ins, you're able to install that Excel analysis tool pack. And then when you go into the data tab, on, uh, I'm assuming that someone is on a, at least Excel 2007 or up, uh, you're able to um, pull up and use dialog boxes uh, to, um, uh, to do the analysis of a, a variance or ANOVA, or in turn to do the, uh, the regression type analysis. So as I say, both are there, and most importantly, they're there for free. It doesn't require additional resources. Just some other thoughts for you on resources. I mentioned already SPSS, and it is now an IBM product. So someone who wants to actually uh, try to get a hold of it, uh, you would need to go through IBM. There is a book uh, that, um, that I've referenced here called Schools and Data by, by Theodore Creighton. Uh, it's available through Amazon, and I provided the number here. We utilize this book um, in, our, in our dissertations, and I was blown away by it. I have seen certainly a number of books on statistics over the years. And books on statistics are typically 
written by statisticians who um, you know tend to write them for just the you know the whole um, uh, statistics for statistics uh, excuse me sake type things or put another way uh, the love affair of statisticians with statistics and so someone who is not a uh, a practitioner of statistics, picking them up, it can be very overwhelming and is often put down. Again, think your own statistics uh, textbooks when you went through uh, your own undergraduate and graduate work. This particular book uh, is written by a person who was a retired superintendent. It is very practically based and runs through live examples of, I have a teacher that wants to look at X or I have an administrator that wants to look at Y, and so they start f trying to figure out how they can analyze it and understand it better and takes you through some very nice practical applications. We actually used it as a book study uh, with a few of the chapters of it in an administrative cabinet retreat uh, after I, uh, last summer and, and everybody found it to be uh, quite helpful. I referenced logic models and I showed you one example of a logic model uh, in this presentation. Probably the best resource that's out there for logic models is, is, uh, is free is also and is published by uh, the Kellogg Foundation, and again, I've given you that reference there. It describes all of the elements, different approaches to logic models, and, uh, and, and essentially elements of a very good one. Finally, I would mention to you, look to your local universities. Uh, having been one myself, I can tell you that when you become a doctoral student, you walk in knowing that you're going to have to write a dissertation someday, and you don't necessarily have any idea what it is that you want to write your dissertation on. Reach out to the professors in that program, and tell them that you, have, you and your district have an interest in having something studied uh, further. You may very well find that you can get one of the doctoral students say, that would make a great dissertation topic, and uh, they will be happy to tap into that need and, and put together a nice analysis for you. In turn, those same professors are always looking for opportunities to come up with articles to be published, so again, you may be able to get some, uh, potentially some free help from these local universities on doing that analysis. So that's kind of a really quick overview of some of the, you know, the major elements of, um, of putting together a program evaluation. You've seen it in a sense probably at a more detailed level than some of you may want to try to jump into, particularly for the first couple of times out. But I believe if you give it some time and try out some of these techniques, you'll find that the, the types of decisions you're able to make, and more importantly, the confidence you can have in the types of decisions you'll, you'll find yourself making will certainly rise if you're, if you're making it more on, on, on clearly documented data and data results and less on intuition and, and anecdotal type evidence. I've left plenty of time for questions, um, so please feel free. I haven't seen any pop up yet on, on the uh, dialog box, but if you have questions, I guess now would be the time. Yep, thank you, Steve. If anyone has a question for Steve, uh, you can certainly use the chat box right on your screen, or you can hit seven pound on your phone. Uh, that'll send me a little notification, and I'll put you right through to Steve. We've got plenty of time to ask questions, so please feel free and uh, go ahead and do so. It would appear that there are a number of eyes that have glazed over in the last few minutes, and if so, I apologize. <laughs> we have uh, no one wanting to ask you a question yet. Again, that's seven pound. If you want to ask Steve a question. Okay, we have a question from Joe Dragone. Um, I, this is a, such a wonderful presentation. I wonder if we could um, find some way of making this presentation to newspaper reporters who um, are still in the mode of thinking that uh, comparing the mean from one school to another is all they need to do. Well, I'm certainly game to share with anybody that's interested. I must profess at least some uh, reservations about the intellect of newspaper reporters to understand it, however. Well, that makes two of us. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Last chance, everyone. Seven pound if you want to ask Steve a question or you have a comment.
Okay, we have a question from uh, Linda. Hi there. I just want to say thanks for doing this. This was really informative. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you found it helpful. Don't, don't be afraid to take some of these on and give it a try. Okay, last call for questions. Again, questions, comments, please hit seven pound on your phone. All right, Steve, looks like that's it. Okay, hey, very good. All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Um, if you're part of the online course, the next webinar on state and federal financial statistical reports and aid reporting is on Monday the 24th, same time next week. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. The moderator has ended the conference. Goodbye. Thank you for calling.